And the first person that's going to speak to us is Lee Tozy. Now, we've been glad to have people from the Southern Regional Education Board. Uh, Lee is the uh, lawyer for the National Conference of State Legislatures, which is all of the legislatures in the country. And she actually, uh, Bonnie, you can correct this if I get it wrong. Bonnie actually goes to Capitol Hill and lobbies on behalf of the 50 state legislatures over education issues. Uh, and she was very, very closely involved, according to what she tells me, uh, at trying to maximize the flexibility that states will have. So my hope is that maybe we can leave here having a fuller understanding of what some of our options may be. So, uh, Lee, did I call you Bonnie? I think I did. Sorry. <laughs> to hit on some of the places that I think that um, legislatures have some flexibility and some opportunity and maybe some challenges. I don't want to pretend that just because we finally got a law that was well overdue for reauthorization passed that everything is necessarily going to be rosy. Um, NCLB was the former version of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. It's been overdue for reauthorization in 2002. And I probably don't need, all of you are probably very familiar with the difficulties in the law. And I think the overall issue that um, we, as representatives of state legislatures, have had is that we saw pretty soon after the law passed that there had been a shift from state and local control to more federal control um, in this law, and a lot of problems um, revolved around that, including the fact that to escape some of the provisions of the law, that states were, had to seek waivers from U.S. Department of Education, and they came with their own requirements. So you had layers of sometimes conflicting requirements, and that really, um, that really made things difficult when states were trying to reform education. I won't go into the timeline of ESCA reauthorization, just to note that we kept hoping it would happen, we kept getting close, and then nothing happened. But finally this summer, the House and Senate had passed their reauthorization bills, and that's something that had happened other times. Um, each chamber had passed their own bill, but they'd never gone to conference. And finally this summer, um, because the um, Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee had managed to do a bipartisan bill that kind of provided a place for everybody to gather and look and see what they could do. The House and the Senate went to conference and they adopted a conference report this November with only one dissenting vote. It's not something you see happening a lot in Washington, D.C. now. And in December, the House and Senate both passed the bill and it was signed into law by the President. And you saw an outburst of bipartisanship and good feeling that you might have thought there was a new baby panda at the National Zoo. I mean, people were really excited. I wanted to put this quote up because it was um, used on the floor a lot in the discussion about um, ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act. The Wall Street Journal called this bill the largest evolution of federal control to the states in a quarter century. A pretty big statement and one that I think deserves a question mark because the devil's always in the detail. But it is something that was profoundly important. I mean, I work for an organization that calls their softball team the Tenth Amendments. I mean, we really want to see um, where the flexibility for states is. And here are a couple of things that I would just very broadly say about the bill before I get into a few of the details. First of all, there's a provision for state legislative involvement that wasn't there. 
to um, give you a historical note, when the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was originally written in 1965, at that point, the relationship set up in the bill was pretty much between the U.S. Department of Education and the state departments of education because the federal government at that point was not feeling particularly good to state, towards state, uh, state elected officials and looked at the control as something that they could do as, as a way of making sure that their goals um, were in the forefront. And that set up some interesting relationships. So NCSL lobbied very hard to get state legislators included on the list of those who have to be consulted before the state's Title I plan is submitted to the U.S. Department of Education. And that seems like a small thing. In some states, it's happening. No one's trying to change the leadership role that the state departments of education have. But we think it's important two things. One, as legislators, you have a, respons a responsibility for education in your state. It's a constitutional or statutory uh, responsibility in all states. And also, education has changed since 1965. In 1965, we tended to think about K-12 education. Now, you want to look at early education, K-12, career technical education, and higher education more as a system. And I think state legislators are uniquely positioned to be able to bring some of those folks to the table that are not all in the same place or the same agency, but really look at education from the broadest perspective. There are a lot of prohibitions in the bill on secretarial or federal authority. I think that any place they could pretty much say the secretary shall not or cannot do do something, they did. Um, the secretary is prohibited from interfering with state adoptions of standards um, and a whole list of other things. So I think it is important um, that that intent is definitely there in the bill that the U.S. Secretary of Education should um, remember that the state authority should be uh, respected. But I think probably the biggest thing in terms of policy is the fact there's a new approach to accountability in the bill. Under No Child Left Behind, you had a system where we had a single metric, adequate yearly progress, to see how students and schools were doing, and one that 100% proficiency was required starting in the 2014 school year. It was a system that, if you talk to some of the people um, on Capitol Hill that were around when the bill was written, thought would be revisited after um, when the bill was reauthorized as it should have been in 2002 and that never happened so states were stuck <coughs> with this system that was very much a top-down um, system and really focused more on um, punitive um, measures if the outcomes weren't there so I think it's really important, um, we'll talk about the accountability system later, to, to focus on the places where, as a state, you're going to have um, some opportunities to really look at how your schools and students are doing. I think that I want to remind you about the process here because, of course, the U.S. Department of Education will be writing, is writing, um, guidance and regulations on this bill. Obviously, what happens when a major piece of legislation uh, federal legislation is passed. The agency in charge um, sends um, information out about how the legislative language should be interpreted. And we have really, really pushed um, the department to bear in mind the clear intent of the law to provide flexibility. We've submitted comments um, to that effect, and we're actively working with a large group of folks in Washington, D.C., who are kind of monitoring the implementation process and reminding the department that there are some places, there are places where clarification and guidance would be very useful. There are also a lot of places where I'm not sure we want um, strict definitions. For example, um, the secretary, there are places, as I said, where he's prohibited from doing things. The secretary cannot uh, prescribe achievement goals or, or um, standards. But on the other hand, the legislation doesn't detail the steps and how exactly how you're going to identify low-performing schools that need intervention, or how you'll determine, um, or how you'll determine the achievement requirements for the subgroups that you were focused on. There are other issues about the accountability system. You have a number of indicators, 
And the language about those indicators and how they interact uses imprecise terms like substantial or much more and talking about their relative ways. So it's really a question as to how much of this uh, the department will try to regulate. I would also add that we're, um, the process is already starting and that they, the department will conduct negotiated rulemaking on certain things, including supplement not supplant requirements in the bill, on assessments, and that process has already started and that they've solicited nominations from various groups to um, bring a group of people together, important stakeholders who can, who can have a discussion and see where they think needs clarified, you know, where they think there should be clarification. If the process doesn't come to a consensus, then the department does write the regulations. But the approach was specified um, in the bill of um, negotiated rulemaking in several specific places. An implementation timeline, we got a lot of questions immediately after the bill has passed about what was going to happen when. Um, the requirements of your ESEA flexibility waivers end as of August 1st of this year. New state plans will be developed in the 2016-17 school year with full implementation in the 2017-2018 school year. So there is some time to talk about some of these things. But it also, in another way, is right around the corner, um, if you look at, at, at the time. So I would kind of consider the 16-17 school year as a dry run for all our pieces of the new state accountability systems. Some of what you're doing is probably not going to change. One of the good things about um, No Child Left Behind, and I think most people agree was a helpful part, is that we have disaggregated data on how various groups of students are doing and in previous, uh, previous to that, their performance may have been washed out in school-wide averages or statewide averages, and we really didn't have a good grasp. That kind of work doesn't go away, and there still is the focus on subgroups. So I think there, there are places where there is a lot of continuity um, in some of the things that were No Child Left Behind, as well as some new things. And I think, as I said earlier, I think the newest part um, is really the difference in the state accountability systems of what that will look like. The law does specify a number of required <coughs> indicators that states will have to use to look at um, how schools and students are doing. Academic achievement is measured by proficiency on annual assessments is one, and I'm gonna um, talk about the assessment issue. I know it's very important um, to state legislatures right now, and I'm gonna talk about that a little more later. Another measure of academic achievement, uh, the progress of English language learners, a measure of school quality and student success. Uh, this could be everything from parental satisfaction with the schools to access to higher level courses or art of music, whatever the state decided was an appropriate measure. And for high schools, graduation rate. Now, this accountability system will still be built on challenging academic standards. Those are standards that states will have to decide. There is a great deal of language that um, underlines the fact that the Secretary of Education can't compel you to adopt any particular standards. But obviously, you'll have a system where you have standards, where they're operationalized and then measured in your assessments, and then you can look at how your schools are doing. I think the only thing I would say is that I, there's some, you know, I think you can get fairly creative on how some of these indicators um, look, and I think this is one place where there is some flexibility to decide what it is that you want to see, you want to find out about how your schools and students are doing, um, and some of that will still probably be part of the um, guidance process and regulatory process as to exactly what the department will consider. But I would urge you to start thinking that through and making your own decisions as a state about what you want to do so that based on what the, the clear reading of the law so that you're in a good position to, to show the department what it is that you want to do. As I said, the assessment issue, um, we track uh, state legislation and education at NCSL and the issue for the past two years that has had more attention than any other if you measure by the number of bills introduced is definitely assessments. And I just want to say um, from the beginning, the biggest thing didn't change in that there's a statewide 
required statewide assessment on the same schedule as New Child Left Behind. That's where you're testing in reading and math um, in grades three through eight and once in high school and science you're doing grade span testing. Congress left that part of the law in place and given the amount of attention that the issue of testing and are we over testing um, has had you might wonder why they came away with, with that when it really, you know, they, they very much heard from their constituents the same way that I'm sure that you hear from your constituents concerns about testing. They really felt that there was a need to have um, statewide assessments. They also felt like the federally required assessments might not be the whole issue. That really what happens is there are an awful lot of state, local, even classroom assessments that are used for very good reasons to look at how students are doing. And some of them may have been implemented because of concerns about the old AYP system where your success met was on one measure and how well you did on that test. So you're gonna to have to, the assessment requirements remain, but they're less high stakes in your accountability system. They're one of your indicators and you can decide some of the other indicators and how you're gonna use that to rank the states. The other thing, and you, if I'm claiming that the law is flexible, this might surprise you, because I know you hear a lot about the 95% participation rate and testing requirement. They made a statement of the parental right to opt, their, there's a statement that the parents, of course, have the right to opt their child out of a test. But unlike some provisions that were floated in other versions of the bill, those students will not be removed from the denominator when determining your 95% participation rate. And I would add that the U.S. Department of Education is very much focused on um, looking at whether or not states achieve that 95% participation rate in testing. They're um, very carefully looking at how, how you do on this measure um, in the past round of testing, what you plan to do if you're not making 95% participation rate in the next round of testing, and ultimately, um, if, if there's not progress on that, you could endanger um, type, some Title I funding or have your Title I grant put on high-risk status. So this remains, um, this remains a place where there is, um, you know, a, a system in place that the federal government um, has determined. But there are also some helpful things that I think they did. You can use your uh, some of your um, assessment funding to audit your state assessment, to so look at what you're doing um, overall as a state and where there might be over testing. And imp importantly, there's also some flexibility in assessment design. In high schools, you could use a nationally recognized high school assessment, I'm thinking SAT or ACT, um, um, for your test. And there is also a provision to develop innovative assessments. Think about what a state like New Hampshire has been working on, where they're trying to look at portfolio-based and other kinds of project and competency-based learning. And you can, you can um, get this flexibility as well. So I guess the question on this issue overall is will the, will the conversation about assessment change? Just to quickly say, um, the law does specify that certain schools require intervention, but what that looks like is very different from the old system that we had under the school improvement grants where there were four federally uh, mandated strategies for um, going into schools where, the, where achievement level was not what you wanted. You have, states will have to identify um, low performing schools every three years, schools that are in the bottom 5% of performance, any high school that fails to graduate a third or more of their students, and any school in which a subgroup of students is underperforming. It was very important um, in discussions about equity in education for students for the focus on subgroups that we saw in NCLB to continue but what is different about this is that states will decide um, how they're gonna um, handle the interventions. And it's actually a little bit different for schools that are in the 5% and the schools where subgroups are, are, are struggling. But basically, um, the LEAs would, would come up with a plan and states would monitor um, how well the effort is going. 
and the provision, um, the expectation is that every, after four years, uh, the states would intervene in some way if there's not been progress, but again, that's not defined. And for the subgroup, <coughs> schools would be notified that they have students in various categories that are not performing um, as well as their peers, and schools would start with trying strategies for um, turning that around. And I think really all I want to draw your attention to on, on this slide is that, um, that you are still um, working with the same subgroups of students, economically disadvantaged uh, students, students from major racial and ethnic groups, students with disabilities, and English language learners that were a focus of NCLB. Um, what kind of st uh, support do you as a state have for schools and students that maybe are having trouble with achievement? There are new student support and academic enrichment grants, which I will describe in a moment. And the um, school improvement funding is set in a different way. Instead of having your school improvement grants, there's a larger amount of the Title I grant and full additional funding in Title I to help make this possible to um, use for school improvement. Um, the new student support and academic enrichment grants, I think, are an excellent opportunity for you to think about what you want to do differently in your schools. What, uh, what the bill did was take the funding from a number of programs, mostly concerned with school climate or school safety, um, but were not effective programs, and build um, a grant program that had three very broad purposes, providing all students with access to well-rounded education, improving school conditions for student learning, and um, improving the use of technology and um, in instruction. Um, I've given you the figure that according to FFIS, North Carolina could expect to receive $46 million um, on this. And I think this, like I said, is a place where um, it's, a, it's a good opportunity to think about with those faults for broad purposes. For example, a well-rounded education. Um, you might want to be able to look at things like, are you providing um, art or music um, with some of this funding? School conditions for student learning. Those are your basic school safety um, and school violence prevention activities. Um, the use of technology is an interesting one, and it's heavily focused. It's focused on instruction, not just buying the infrastructure. But I think that um, this, like I said, is one place that I think states should look around. Um, I simply will say that um, in Title One. There was a lot of discussion about portability of Title I funding, allowing funds to follow the student. That did not make it into the bill, but there is a way to student funding pilot that would allow some districts to experiment with how they put together state, federal, and local funding. I'm trying to keep within my um, time limit here. Um, just to uh, remind you about Title II, which is where the federal funding that supports uh, teachers and principals is. We've already talked a little bit about that, but I think that um, the important thing for you is that they did make a, a formula change, which, and, and Senator Burrow was one of those that was very active in this, that um, does change the formula from being based as much on the overall number of children in, um, to being shifted from, excuse me, shifted from being based more on the overall number of children in poverty and the share of children overall um, and changes that percentage so that North Carolina would benefit and, and receive more Title II funding. So I think that's one thing that um, as a state you'll want to know. Just a reminder, I'm talking a lot about the Title I provisions and accountability. Um, there are a lot of other programs in ESSA. And just to remind you that they're there, you can read the list, but important things that I know matter in North Carolina, impact aid, um, rural education, Indian and Native education programs, magnet schools, the federal funding for charter schools. One other area that was of great interest to some members, especially Senator Murray, the ranking member of the Senate Health Committee, early education. 
the preschool development grant program um, is in the bill at 250 million a year similar but not exactly the uh, preschool development grants that are available now um, i think probably of interest is the fact that through other programs in the bill there is uh, the ability to use some of your funding for younger learners for example in the literacy grant program that's in the bill and there are other permissive uses of funding in title one through title four in the bill so i think um, that is that is something that shows that there was a lot of interest in early education but that we're not ready to um, do anything remotely like a full-scale federal pre-k program so i will leave you with our contact information and a link to the ncsl website where we're collecting a lot of documents including as the U.S. Department of Education sends out information, we will post um, the link there so that you have a place that you can find the latest documents from the department um, on one sheet. So. Thank you, Lee. Uh, quickly, we're going to move to Claire Voorhees. Claire is Director for K-12 Reform with the Foundation for Excellence in Education. And uh, I'm going to uh, hope that Claire well, maybe highlight for us maybe some opportunities that are uh, going to be available to the state under this compared to what we have been used to. Did you have a question? I have one question. Okay. Uh, um, Representative Horn has a question for Ms. Hudson. Does the term assessment have to be test? That when, when the term, when assessment is mentioned in the bill, it is defined in various you know there's a various list of such as and it can include a lot of things beyond what we think of as a bubble in um, test it can include competency based um, it can include portfolios it can include a lot of different things there are requirements if it's for statewide assessment it needs to be something that all state all children take and is um, and so I think that's important to remember. And I would also add that the U.S. Department of Education has reminded everyone that there is a peer review process of your state assessments to ensure that they're um, correct in terms of all the psychometric measurements that they have to, um, you know, that, that is reliable and valid and all of those. So, so I guess that that's trying to ensure that there are assessing different ways, and that can include. Um, you know, summative assessments as you go along in the year, as long as you can get a final um, assessment score on that. So, so, so there are some options in that. Thank you. 